we're going to talk about logical fallacies, especially how they come into play in group discussions and team discussions. I am working out of BB and Masterson's book, Communicating in Small Groups. I will put a link to that in the description below. So let's get into it. Now, it's really important to think logically and process logically in groups and teams because if you don't, you can get the discussion off in a direction that's completely unproductive. So we're gonna talk about the top six ways that you can spot these logical fallacies. And this enhances your critical thinking and critical analysis skills. So clear thinking in groups requires the ability to critically analyze information and ideas, both the logic and the evidence used in your own and others' arguments. So you wanna be able to Avoid using these yourself and use good logical reasoning. And then also notice when other people might be using them and move the conversation in a better direction. We want to avoid reasoning fallacies or logical fallacies. These are false or inaccurate reasoning that occurs when someone attempts to arrive at a conclusion without adequate evidence or with arguments that are irrelevant or inappropriate. It doesn't mean like a parent saying, that's inappropriate but it's more like you're trying to use arguments or evidence that don't fit the situation. They're not appropriate given the current discussion. The goal is to be able to spot these and avoid using them. So let's go through the top six. Number one, the causal fallacy, not the casual fallacy. This isn't about being informal. It's about cause and effect. This is unsupported assumption that one event causes another when little evidence connects the two things. Sometimes this is called post hoc, or ergo prompter hoc, which means after this, therefore because of this. Sometimes in life, something happens, A, and then if something happens right after it, B, we think, oh, cause effect, that thing led to the other thing. When really the two things may just be coincidentally happening around the same time, you see this often in superstition, especially around the issue of sports. Like I was wearing a red shirt on the day my favorite team won the game. And then I might say to myself, I was wearing a red shirt on the day the Buffalo Bills won, so I have to wear my red shirt for the rest of the season. You know, coaches do this, players do this, fans do this. And in some ways, it's pretty ridiculous. It's, you're falling for this causal fallacy that, oh, because I wore my red shirt, the game they won the game when no evidence exists. Now, if you do this personally, what's the big deal? But if you bring that kind of thinking into your team and group discussion, then probably it's not gonna move the discussion in a productive direction. Number two, the either or fallacy. And this is a big one. Sometimes people argue that there's only two possible approaches or solutions to a problem when more than one exists or possibly a middle ground. This is called a false dichotomy that states you either have to do X or Y. That's rarely the case. And usually when people say that, they're trying to get you to pick the obvious solution that they want. Like, and there's a former president once said, you're either with us or you're with our enemies. And the implication was you have to stand behind us in everything we say, or that means you're automatically against us. You're either with us or against us. It's like, wait a minute, what if I see a little bit of both sides? Or what if I want to find a middle ground? Or what if I agree with you, but I also may see problems in your solution that could be improved. There are lots of other options on the table, but the either or fallacy tries to force you into choice A or choice B, usually the preferred choice of the two. Number three, the bandwagon fallacy. This fallacy claims that everybody supports a decision, put that in quotes, everybody, so that you should too. First of all, it's very unlikely that everybody supports a particular position. Usually there's disagreement across the board on almost every single issue I've ever heard of. But the idea there is that, hey, this is the popular idea, so you should support it, instead of judging the idea based upon its merits, the quality of the evidence, the quality of the argument. And I wanna make a note that You could say that everybody is against something, like nobody supports that. So you should support the position that we support. That's really the same thing. They're both arguing from the standpoint of popularity. But as any student of history knows, things that were popular at one point can quickly change and become unpopular. So that shows you right there that those, that, is not necessarily the right choice in a given situation because things can change very rapidly when it comes to popular opinion. And number four, hasty generalization. This is another really popular one. 
That's where we reach a conclusion on the basis of too little evidence or evidence that doesn't even really exist. I heard someone once say about consultants, consultants all rip you off because maybe they had a bad experience with one consultant that ripped them off. Well, that doesn't mean all consultants. That's a generalization, a hasty generalization based upon that one experience. Oftentimes, we do this with groups of people, especially groups of people that we're not all that familiar with. So X, you might say X people are all blank, you know, like fill in the group of their people and fill in the generalization. Maybe you had one bad experience. Maybe you heard from a friend that they had a bad experience, but you can't generalize the entire group based upon that tiny bit of evidence. I once heard, heard someone say something along the lines of, well, kids don't need physical education in school because my kid gets plenty of activity and loves to play outside. So they don't need PE, they don't need recess. Well, that's saying that because it's good for one person, it's generalizable to everybody. And that's really not the way you want to think logically. That's a, a total fallacy. Number five is attacking the person. This is really common in terms of when people get a bit nasty. It's also called ad hominem. That's attacking the man or at the man. That means that instead of engaging the substance of their argument, you say something about them more personally. So it's attacking irrelevant personal characteristics about someone rather than examining the idea or the proposal that they advance. So just because it came from someone you don't like, you refuse to listen to it. Someone might say, someone once said to me, well, what do you know? You're a Patriots fan because I follow the New England Patriots. That's attacking me. They don't have to listen to anything I say because of the football team that I happen to support. And I've also heard someone say something along the lines of, are we really going to listen to a guy who eats pizza with a fork? You know, that's the kind of thing a comedian might say and be funny, but you can't let that kind of logic and reasoning work its way into a group or team discussion because you start making decisions for really bad reasons instead of good reasons that'll help your team. And number six, the red herring. This one, I don't even know if this is a true story, but the idea is using an irrelevant fact or statement to distract from a discussion that's supposed to be the focus. Now that does happen, but what's the origin of this red herring? What does that even mean? Well, a herring is a fish. And the story goes that bad guys used to drag a herring on the ground of the path that they were going on. So it would distract the sniffing dogs off the trail and the dogs and the police couldn't find them something along those lines. I don't know if that's true. That sounds like a real weird kind of way to handle a situation, but that's red herring is a distraction, bringing up something that's not relevant to the topic at hand to get people's focus off so you don't have to deal with it. Maybe your argument's weak. Maybe you don't know what to say. And so you distract away from the key issue. Someone might say the real issue isn't high crime in one neighborhood. We should be focusing on reducing pollution because that helps all neighborhoods. Well, if you're there to talk about high crime in a neighborhood, then you shouldn't distract everybody by bringing up pollution. That's a red herring. And that might sound like a stretch, but honestly, I've heard people bring up all kinds of distracting arguments that they shouldn't do. And so those are the top six key points to take away from this. Learn to spot logical fallacies. The tip I like to do is I use I statements. I say, well, I'm not following that argument. I don't see the connection. And that helps them explain a little bit more. You want to, of course, avoid avoid using them. And that is to maintain a tight relationship between the evidence and the claim you make. So question of the day, which of these top six do you find the most interesting? I would love to hear your comments in that section below the video. Take care and I will see you soon.